Um, on, on that note, yeah. let's get to some of the <laughs> the more authentic musicians. Well, <laughs> I like that music has like, I mean, I know there, I could go into the postmodern theories on authenticity and identity and so on and so forth. But, you know, that's what makes a lot of music political. That's mm. what allows some people to inject their politics into their music. And people really like to be able to connect with people on that level. I think your segment gets to a lot of that. Yeah. and, and um... Yeah, I'm going to be talking about, I, I decided to highlight some big names, people that everybody knows to make the same point that um, I'm going to be talking about um, three members of the Highwaymen, which is, you know, one of the greatest uh, country and just in general super groups of all time, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, and Chris Christopherson. Um, no disrespect uh, to Waylon Jennings, uh, my personal favorite, but these just fit really well. Um, but, you know, I could also be talking about um, other artists like Blaze Foley or Towns Van Zandt, right? You know, you might know who Towns Van Zandt is, but, you know, he spent a life, even though he wrote music that was covered by everybody, he was one of the most influential musicians probably of all time in the United States. Um, you know, somebody who really struggled financially because he was constantly getting screwed over by, uh, you know, this, this system, this capital system, which rewarded extremely predatory and also, you know, highly um, monopolized uh, record and, and music industry, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I want to focus on, on these folks too, and also give a little bit of, of a defense for country music or an argument for country music, because country music is extremely personal to me. Um, it, it's, it's been the back, you know, the, the music in the backdrop of my life. Um, it makes me think of home and family and all these things. Um, and I get very angry when I see the state of, of country music today uh, be, because what we saw happening in like the golden era of country music, right, where you have these outlaw stars like Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson fighting against the record industry um, and really pushing a different kind of music. Um, what we're living through today is a period of time where those like record executives and, uh, you know, capital in general has won out. And, you know, the people who get the most money in country music aren't making the best music. And they're also, you know, I mean, think about what happened uh, after 9-11 all of those terrible country songs you know, supported the Iraq war when that wasn't the history of, of country music. And I think it's really important for fans of it to try to reclaim it today. But let's, let's, uh, let's, let's get into Johnny Cash for a second. We all know Johnny Cash as a rebel, right? The man in black, you know, somebody who seemed to have a lot of fun, drugs, alcohol, all that kind of stuff. But let's not forget where he came from. If we have this first clip up here, Kale, um, Johnny Cash came from Dice, Arkansas. There was nobody rich when it came to dice. Everybody was in the same boat. They didn't have no money, no nothing. They came here, they were poor as you could be. They were just trying to, to make a living to feed their family. And this was a new beginning. Before 1934, Dice Colony was uh, non-existent. It was a cypress swamp, and it flooded frequently. And as part of the Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal administration, the federal government purchased the land from adjacent landowners, drained parts of it, and built um, a new community, a new town that offered relief and economic opportunity for farm families across Arkansas that were affected by the Depression. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing story right here. Johnny Cash comes from that town. Johnny Cash was a product of the New Deal, was a product of social programs. And despite how many conservatives try to own Johnny Cash and, and country music, Johnny Cash would describe um, his early life as this. I grew up under socialism, kind of. Maybe a better word would be communalism, right? Johnny Cash had this radical upbringing that came out of the labor militancy that was able to push through so many of the best programs of the New Deal. And let's not forget, you know, we all know the story of, of Johnny Cash. He spent a long time fighting to get into the, you know, the music industry. Um, remember, it, it took a lot for him to really get a serious listen um, from the folks who basically owned access to the radio waves. Um, you know, but of course, we all know Johnny Cash is a household name. He became uh, an extremely influential musician who changed the face of country music and music in this country in general, right? Um, but he spent his entire time having to fight against a music industry that tended to be extremely conservative, not just politically, but also musically, uh, an industry that was very resistant to change. And I just want you to remember this, that these things are about power at the end of the day. 
Um, from the previous segment, we were talking about how artists are trying to fight to have control over their own music. Um, it's been the case from the beginning. And the reason for that is that capitalism allows a few people to exert incredible amounts of power over all of us, even if you're a big star. Music is no different. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Johnny Cash's life um, and this kind of radical tradition. You know, folks uh, might know this, but, you know, Johnny Cash actually played for Richard Nixon. Um, and it's a very interesting story because Johnny Cash is invited to go play for Richard Nixon you know, in the middle of this brutal war. And Richard Nixon requests that he plays Okie from Muskogee. For folks who aren't familiar with that, it's a satirical song uh, written by Merle Haggard, um, uh, basically about beating up hippies who are anti-war, right? Funny story, by the way, uh, when uh, Johnny Cash played his famous concert in San Quentin Prison, Merle Haggard was in that audience. Anyway, Johnny Cash declines uh, Richard Nixon's request and says, I've got a few of my own to play for you. The first song he played was the Ballad of Ira Hayes. Ira Hayes was one of the American soldiers and, and a Native American who ended up holding the flag at the Battle of Iwo Jima, that famous photograph. Um, he wrote this. This song is about how he came back from the war and was mistreated by the government and the system. Um, some of the lyrics go down the ditches a thousand years. The waters grew Irish people's crops till the white man stole their water rights and the sparkling water stopped. Then Johnny Cash went on to play What is Truth, which was an anti-Vietnam song and called out the, you know, was basically calling on the ruling class of the society to have some humanity and to listen seriously to the questions that were being brought up by the young folks in the society. And the last song he played was Man in Black. And for folks who aren't familiar with that song, that's Johnny Cash des describing why he wears his signature black. And it's not just a stylistic choice. He wears it for the poor and beaten down, living in the hopeless, hungry side of town. He wears it for the prisoner who has paid for his crime, but is there because he's a victim of the time. Johnny Cash was through and through a radical. Um, and if you think that art can change anyone, that is quite an opportunity to play for somebody as insane and monstrous as Richard Nixon and to play those kind of songs. And one last thing about Johnny Cash and his music, I think, and I propose here, a song that needs to become a mainstay in uh, left organizing spaces is Oni, uh, which is a ballad that Johnny Cash wrote about a worker who is waiting for the whistle at the end of his last day at the job after spending his entire life working for somebody else, um, because once that whistle blows, he's going to punch his boss in the face. Um, he dedicates the song to the working man. Um, for every man that puts in eight or 10 hard hours a day of work, toil, and sweat, always got somebody looking down his neck, trying to get more out of him than he really ought to have put in. I bring this up to just compare it to what you're going to hear on you know, popular country radio stations today. Nothing as radical as this, but that's the tradition of country music. Um, and before we move on uh, from Johnny Cash, I also just want to throw this one out here because it's a great clip um, from Johnny Cash, who actually was in uh, the miniseries North and South. And when he knew that this was going on, he specifically demanded to play the radical abolitionist John Brown. And these are members of my staff. You talk as though we're at war, sir. We most certainly are. My men and I came all the way from Kansas to make sure justice prevails and to ensure the freedom of Negroes in this state. I love that clip, one, because it's great to see Johnny Cash as John Brown, uh, but also because Patrick Swayze has a terrible Southern accent and Johnny Cash just cannot um, you know, hold back his own uh, twang. Um, but let's talk about Willie Nelson for a second, too, because this is another person who we all know, um, you know, because of his you know, love of weed. Uh, Willie Nelson is obviously an incredible human being, an incredible musician, but this is another person too who had to spend the early parts of his career fighting against a record industry which refused to let him play music his own way. And it's just something that you have to think about. One, you know, these are labor issues, but man, it's a, such a horrible crime to think about how many other people were not allowed uh, to basically present their music to the world because a bunch of wealthy people um, who control basically access uh, to you know to music production prevent uh, visionaries and artists from being able to to make music. You know he had to leave Nashville, come to Austin, where there was a much more you know laid back hippie scene to be able to become the Willie Nelson that we all know and love today. Um, but I I wanted to focus on one aspect of uh, Willie Nelson's advocacy that a lot of folks miss out on. 
Uh, Willie Nelson has been a longtime supporter of Leonard Peltier. I believe we have a couple photographs of, of Leonard, too. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, Leonard Peltier was a member of the American Indian Movement who was framed for murder of two FBI agents and is still in prison today, an American political prisoner. Willie Nelson constantly would do benefit concerts in support of Leonard Peltier and for Leonard Peltier's freedom. Um, we have this one right here, uh, Cowboys for Indians and Justice for Leonard Peltier. Willie, Willie Nelson would do these concerts so frequently that the police to this day will show up at his concerts in protest. And we have this last uh, LA Times uh, article on this as well. Um, benefit concert for, for convicted killer haunts Willie Nelson, right? Um, that's from 1988. But basically, you know, from Boston, um, you know, all across the country, police unions will show up at Willie Nelson's con concerts to demand uh, that he apologize for supporting Leonard Peltier. He still stands with Leonard, right? And this is some of, one of those things that it gets completely overshadowed um, on purpose by a music industry that wants to hide how radical and progressive these folks were. Um, just while we're on Leonard Peltier and music, uh, Stephen Van Zandt, uh, who you might know from either Bruce Springsteen or from The Sopranos, uh, also is an outspoken uh, supporter of, of Leonard Peltier too. And I highly suggest you check out some of the uh, songs that he's written about Leonard Peltier. They are very, very goofy. Um, but last, um, but not least, I wanted to talk about Chris Christopherson, um, who is also a member of the Highwaymen. And he was somebody uh, who was an incredible poet and writer and thinker, and he's a musician that you really should dive into if you're not familiar. Um, but he he's somebody who, too, had to fight to get into the record industry. And they would constantly, even when he became a big star, would tell him that he could not sing the songs about the things that he wanted to sing about, or, or they would try to censor his music, right? And that's because he was an outspoken critic of U.S. imperialism, not just the war in Vietnam, but he was a supporter of the Sandinistas. Um, and he was obviously an outspoken critic of the war in Iraq. Um, and he had to spend his career, even though he was one of the most famous artists out there, constantly having contracts pulled out from underneath his feet because record companies didn't want somebody who was talking about truth and justice. And we have this last little clip here about him talking about censorship in music. The reason that... Uh the music didn't have an effect on the war in Iraq was not that we stopped making the music, was that they stopped playing it. I think it's, I think the people behind the censorship, I know ultimately it may be people in the government, but I, I think directly it's people who are affected economically by it, who feel that their product won't sell. I know that was the the uh, uh, first excuse that was given to me, uh, they said I, I had become unmarketable because I was writing songs like They Killed Him, which was about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And, and, uh, and they said that I simply was unmarketable in what they perceived as my market. And that's exactly it. I mean, Chris really lays out the dynamic there is people who have economic interests in making sure that certain messages are not allowed uh, to reach the general public. Um, and this, again, is somebody who is one of the most legendary and celebrated country music artists ever who is having his own work <laughs> be censored. I, I think, you know, it's something that's not unique to country music, but it's something that I think we should be more and more up in arms about because, you know, people oftentimes say it's like, oh, I, I miss the golden era of country music when people wrote, you know, great songs and stood up for social causes. That still exists today. The problem is that the record companies have been able to win that fight, that they are able to prevent anybody from getting big and famous um, who is not going to toe the line. There are exceptions, and that's a good thing. But what we have, we're have we seeing in country music right now is not that the music itself or the style of music or the idea or the history of it um, you know, is, is conservative or like necessarily like needs to make the kind of terrible music that you're hearing today. Um, it's actually happened because there is a deliberate choice by those at the top 
to make sure that this music is bleached of any kind of radical message, pro-worker message uh, that is its roots and its history. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And the way that he talks about the kind of overlapping interests, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's economic. Mm -hmm. We've seen this more too with people talking about Nina Simone's life, everything that she went through, which is just absolutely heartbreaking and brutal um, for her political messages. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like your point that it's not that the music is changing, it's that who you're hearing is changing. <laughs> I think that's exactly that, right. that will put a boot in your ass song. <laughs> Toby <laughs> Keith is a real jackass. There's a funny <laughs> story about Toby Keith and, and Chris Chris Balverson to tell maybe later. <laughs> uh, yeah, we should do that. We should bring in Jason for that.